They say truth is stranger than fiction. And with the recent government shutdown, along with crowdfunding to build a border wall, that adage is as appropriate as ever. It all sounds like an absurdist movie where everything is taken to the extreme. Maybe the government should hold a telethon to fund whatever it wants. Maybe it should hold an Americathon. Americathon the movie was released in 1979 and starred John Ritter, Fred Willard, Peter Rieger, and Harvey Korman, among many others. While barely breaking the top 50 in U.S. domestic gross, the film is better known today for the number of predictions it made that were remarkably close to the mark. Based on a story by Firesign Theater's Phil Proctor and Peter Bergman, the screenplay was a collaboration between Monica Johnson, Michael Mislove, and Neil Israel, who also directed. Americathon was only Israel's second directing gig, his first being the 1976 GrooveTube clone, Tunnel Vision. What he would write and direct later would be a mixed bag at best. In 1984, Israel co-wrote and directed the early Tom Hanks classic, Bachelor Party. While the next year, he would author Real Genius, starring Val Kilmer. But he would gain infamy, at least in my book, for writing and developing the original Police Academy movie, spawning endless crappy sequels throughout the 80s and beyond. And if that wasn't bad enough, he would go on to pen Look Who's Talking To in 1990. But in the late 70s, he was working on Americathon while still learning about crappiness. Endless energy crises have left many living in their now stationary cars, with other vehicles repurposed for things like schools. Human power, in all of its various guises, is the only viable means to commute. Because of this, athletic wear has come to be acceptable business attire. President Chet Roosevelt, played by Redder, leads the country from his Western White House condo, indulging in his proclivity for self-help fads like Est. And he needs as much self-esteem as he can muster because the country is in dire financial straits. The government has borrowed $400 billion from the richest man in the world, Native American Sam Birdwater, portrayed by Chief Dan George. George was best known at the time for roles in Harry and Tonto, The Outlaw Josie Wales, and Little Big Man which was perhaps his most memorable performance. Birdwater became wealthy by producing the jogging suits everyone wears, as well as skateboards, bicycles, roller skates, and clown shoes, made through his company National Indian Knitting Enterprises, better known as Nike. Sam now wants repayment of his loan, otherwise he'll assume control of the United States. In desperation, Roosevelt has been selling off the country's assets, but hasn't even come close to the amount needed. To solve the dilemma, he decides upon a televised raffle. It's while consulting for this raffle that we meet Rieger's character, the unfortunately named Eric McMurkin, TV guru. The movie is also narrated by an older McMurkin, portrayed by George Carlin, reflecting on events from some time in an unnamed future. Eric advises against a raffle and suggests a telethon, which inspires Roosevelt to dub it An Americathon! Riegert was still enjoying success from his previous film, Animal House, which definitely didn't prepare him for what was to come in Americathon. It's at this point that Nancy Morgan should be mentioned. Otherwise, I'll forget her forgettable role as the president's girlfriend, Lucy Beth. Don't get me wrong, Morgan does an admirable job as her character. It's just that Lucy Beth is primarily an afterthought and just thrown in as a love interest. Morgan had previously been cast as the female lead in Ron Howard's directorial debut, Grand Theft Auto, and would go on to be a respected television actress. Yet in Americathon, her talent is wasted. But on with the story. Harvey Corman's Monty Rushmore is selected as the telethon's host. Known for his popular sitcom, Both Father and Mother, Rushmore is America's favorite actor. He's got the entertainment chops, as well as a suitcase full of drugs, for the 30-day ordeal on stage. 
Incidentally, it's in the opening numbers of the telethon that we see a young, simple shepherd as the Golden Girl, encouraging you to part with your money and do your civic duty. Thankfully, we're only treated to glimpses of the seemingly endless acts, which in the beginning are mainly ventriloquists, thanks to the scheming of Fred Willard's character, Vincent Vanderhoff, and his role in the main subplot. Vanderhoff is trying to sabotage the telethon for reasons known only to him, be it money or be it hatred for Roosevelt. If the country defaults, then the Hebrabs can buy out the loan and take over America. The new power in Europe and the Middle East, the Hebrabs are a coalition of both Israelis and Arabs who've discovered that they are more powerful teamed up than they are butting heads over religion. One of the few acts we see in its entirety is Muling Jackson, Vietnamese puke rocker. Muling is played by Zane Busby, who had just appeared as Jade East in Cheech and Chong's Up in Smoke. You know, and she'd start going like a motorboat, you know. Later, playing the Rolling Stone reporter in 1984's This is Spinal Tap. In America Thon, she's a singing sensation who has a brief fling with the president, is kidnapped, and happens to be from Nam. With its pristine beaches no longer being shelled by American GIs and generous odds at its numerous casinos, Vietnam has become the French Riviera of Southeast Asia, a major destination for tourists worldwide, kind of like it is now. This is pointed at as one of the many predictions that the movie made that came true. Other prophecies included the greater acceptance of cross-dressing and transgender individuals as seen in the Monty Rushmore bits the ascendancy of China as an economic world power, the ubiquitous wearing of athletic wear, even when one isn't working out, Nike becoming a worldwide brand, and the governor of California becoming president. While on the surface it appears the writers were geniuses, in tune with where their world was headed. In truth, they were expounding on the views of the day and taking them to what they thought were comedic extremes take the depiction of China as an economic power. In the 70s, China was still perceived as a backward country, slowly ridding itself of its isolationist stance. What would be the complete opposite? A country that dominates global markets and is an economic powerhouse. In the movie, the explanation is that Americans have developed a yen for Asian fast food, not that they have cheap labor, and the largest workforce the world has ever seen. Nike was probably paid for the use of their logo and name, a name that fit with the acronym made up for the story. What was the last place tourists wanted to go in the 70s? Vietnam. And what was one of the biggest left-getters in that decade, as utilized by the likes of Monty Python? Cross-dressing. So I don't think Proctor and Berkman had a crystal ball, so much as they were masters at taking an existing situation and altering it to its ultimate pinnacle. If they were really good at predicting things, how did they get so much wrong, like England becoming the 57th state? I think the real joke was that it did somewhat coincide with what came to pass. Also that so many actors, actresses, and musicians were involved in its making. Howard Hessman's role as TV producer was almost non-existent, as were the briefest of cameos by Tommy Lasorda, Peter Marshall, and Willie Tyler. Jay Leno experienced the most unfunny moment in his career. Some of us would be introduced to the Del Rubio sisters for the first time, and catch a glimpse of the tragic Dorothy Stratton. Meatloaf and Elvis Costello made appearances as Daredevil Oklahoma Roy Budnitz, and musician Earl Manchester, but were really just in it to promote their music, of which we thankfully only hear Costello's. Even the Beach Boys did a good job with the opening tune, It's a Beautiful Day. Overall, the soundtrack was possibly better than the movie itself, including songs by not only Elvis Costello and the Beach Boys, but Eddie Money and Nick Lowe as well. So what happened in the end? Were the lights turned off? Did Monty raise enough dough? Did the president ditch his girlfriend for the exotic Moulin? Was Peter Rieger as stoned as he looked? Well, I'll let you figure that out by renting or buying the film through our links in the description. 
I will tell you that they decided to rename the film Americathon 1998 for the video release, and that the real 1998 was nothing like the movie other than the Chinese fast food. That about does it for this episode. Before we go, I'd like to let you know that you can also show your support for Alter Past by becoming a patron through our Patreon account, gaining access to extra content. Look for the link in the description. Also, be sure to subscribe to Alter Past and never miss an episode of The Past You Never Knew. Give this video a like if you enjoyed it. All feedback is appreciated. Read a more in-depth account of the story in the original blog post at alterpast.wordpress.com. Thanks for watching. This is Will Carlson, and I'll see you in the Alterpast.